real five is connecting up cryptocurrency liquidity to real world asset classes. What are these real world asset classes? Well, they can be a loan portfolio. Um, it could be a uh, it could be a sustainable house in Mozambique. Uh, it can really be anything where people have real economic needs um, and need real tangible things. And RealFi is about providing the finance towards that. Welcome back to another Empower podcast. Today, we're going to be joined by John O'Connor, Director of African Operations at Input Output. Today's episode is going to be all about RealFi, uh, specifically RealFi adoption in Africa. We're going to explore challenges, opportunities, some uh, scaling uh, strategies in Africa, and also the future of real fire, what that could potentially look like. So if that interests you, please stick around. And without further ado, let's dive into today's interview. To start us off, can you please give a quick rundown on who you are, uh, maybe a bit of a background into how you got involved in, in this beautiful Cardano ecosystem and your current role at IOG? Sure. So let me uh, start off by saying, Blaine, feel free to stop me if my internet cuts out. Uh, I've got a classic problem when I do podcasts, which is I, I'm never in a, a place where I've got great internet. Um, so, you know, sorry to all the viewers if, if I cut out a bit. Um, but yeah, my name is John O'Connor. I'm the director of African operations at Input Alpha, the technology company behind Cardano. I've been at this role now for close to five years. Um, it started uh, with me shifting from the Cardano Foundation, which is where I began my Cardano journey, moving to Ethiopia to set up an Africa-focused entity that would basically work on the adoption stories. So less of this, if we build it, they will come mentality and more, let's start seeing what the real user stories are, figuring out what people really need before we do all of this tech development. So I moved to Ethiopia to kick that off and started working very heavily on our digital identity product, which was the foundational layer of, uh, of really all of our efforts. So I've probably said this a billion times now, but if you want to offer finance to people, you need to know who they are. How do you know who someone is in a digital ecosystem? Well, you know, you, you can't just say, hey, I'm John, you know, uh, you know me from down the road or from down the pub. Uh, so we need to have some form of credentials which can be shared securely in a digital world which enables then, of course, this financial layer, which is what I'm so excited about. So this is sort of where we get on to RealFi. RealFi is connecting up cryptocurrency liquidity to real world asset classes. What are these real world asset classes? Well, they can be a loan portfolio. Um, it, could be a, uh, it could be a sustainable house in Mozambique. Uh, it can really be anything where people have real economic needs um, and need real tangible things. And RealFi is about providing the finance towards that. So typically, RealFi projects often orientate around emerging economies, about populations which are either underbanked or unbanked. Um, so what we've been doing here at Cardano is trying to build the framework and the tooling to enable great projects like Empower to go and build on top of this and create these RealFi opportunities. So if I was to sort of classify the ones which I've seen so far on the Cardano space, we have World Mobile, which is one of the first deals which we did, um, focused on providing cheaper data across Africa. Then of course we have Empower Now, focused on a sustainable, sustainable housing market. And uh, we've also got some interesting new projects cropping up at the moment. There's a great uh, decentralized textile production company. Um, which is uh, also building on Cardano at the moment. So we're starting to see some of this stuff um, emerging naturally. Uh, and then on top of that, you've got some of my efforts, which are maybe focused more about working with existing microfinance companies um, to be able to start providing providing that bridge. So how much of that did you hear, Blaine? Uh, or was I cutting out all the I, way I, I heard 100% <laughs> of it. So touch wood, that continues. So great answer. Okay. Um, so there's obviously some similarities between RealFi and DeFi, with RealFi probably being kind of like a subset of, of DeFi. Could we elaborate a bit more on some of the, the differences? Because uh, RealFi is more of a, a term that is familiar within the Cardano ecosystem, and hopefully that spreads outside of that because that would obviously benefit more people, which is a good thing. Um, but what are some of the characteristics associated with um, uh, RealFi that differentiates it? from DeFi? 
Yeah, so, you know, a, a DeFi example would be, I've got my ADA in a Nexo account and I borrow off my ADA um, or maybe I put money into a, some sort of pool and I'm rewarded with tokens for that activity, um, which is great. You know, this sort of Lego box for money concept is incredibly powerful. But in general, if I was to do a bit of a straw man, it's mm -hmm. I borrow on from my crypto, collateralize against my crypto to earn more crypto, which I then might invest to generate more crypto. Um, it's all just, you know, generating crypto with crypto and uh, not to denigrate the intelligence of this stuff. Real fi would be more, I've got this crypto collateral and I press a couple of buttons on my wallet. And actually what that ends up doing is providing a loan for uh, a Kenyan small and medium sized enterprise, maybe a news agent, but coming up to the holiday season and needs a little bit of working capital, call it a thousand dollars to be able to buy more stock for the holiday period. So what we've done here is facilitated a real world loan, which is generating real world productive economic value from the value that we have in crypto. And this is really important because these sort of, you know, SMEs, they're often dealing with uh, very poor access to credit, despite the fact that they're very good businesses. So this is what I mean by when I say real fi. you know, it's going to have some sort of real world economic thing at the end of the rainbow. Yeah. So I love real fi. I love real fi. I love DeFi. And so just if I had to kind of maybe summarize that in my head, the DeFi, the, the flow, the value flow is kind of within this blockchain silo, um, whereas the real five flow of value flows from crypto uh, and enters this into the real world and has real world value. So kind of similar things, yeah. uh, an emphasis on kind of tapping into this uh, crypto liquidity and then flowing that into real world applications. Um, Blaine, Blaine, are you uh, are you gunning for my job? You just summarized what I said in about five minutes, unnecessarily worded in like two sentences, which is what I should have said. So you'll have to forgive me. I haven't had my coffee today. So, uh... um, so as the director of African operations at IOG, so in the intro, I was kind of talking about maybe some some high level real fast strategy. What what is your broader kind of high level real fast strategy for for Africa? So I want to focus on the enablement, you know, uh, solving the problems which we're quite well suited to do because of our scale and because of our, of our access. So actually, as of just today, um, we're actually lending directly from our own from our own balance sheet into um, Kenyan SMEs uh, to be able to sort of figure out what the bottlenecks are when we try to turn this from, you know, something smaller pilot into scale. So what do those bottlenecks look like? Well, as I'm going from crypto into Kenyan shillings, uh, maybe the broker that's meant to do that for us actually takes five times longer to do it than they say they will. Maybe the capacity which they say they have is um, half as big as what they say. So these kinds of teething problems, you know, I sort of see it as our job to figure out. Secondly, you've got a whole bunch of regulatory challenges or regulatory requirements um, which are inhibiting these kinds of flows. So let's say I want to lend into this Kenyan SME. Well, the Kenyan regulator needs to know the KYC information of every single investor that's putting in money into this opportunity. So that makes sense in a TradFi world where I have these complicated KYC forms and all of the rest. But what if I'm just lending from a wallet? Well, you know, it's a slightly different scenario. So we're well placed to either ameliorate these blockers with technology or to work proactively with governments on doing the regulatory changes. You know, we've sort of hit that size and scope now where I can go and talk to a regulator and I can make it clear why uh, you know, there's actually value adds for the government or value adds for this industry rather than being extractive. So, you know, these conversations are happening and they're happening successfully. So that's the kind of part I want to do. It's all of the boring stuff. So cool companies like Empower can go and just, you know, build and stuff works. Uh, so that's sort of where I see our role. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in, in terms of, I guess, making real fire a tangible thing in the real world. So you know, it's not just a great idea in, in theory, but it's a great idea in practice where, you know, many Africans are using real fire applications on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, what do you see as some of the, the major roadblocks um, 
maybe roadblocks that you've come across already or roadblocks that you anticipate uh, that need to be addressed somehow uh, in order to, to make real fire a viable alternative to TradFire in mm. Africa? Um, so, you know, I think I discussed some of them in terms of regulatory um, challenges. Um, you know, one of the other challenges which you run into quite regularly is how do I turn my crypto into fiat, my fiat back into crypto? Um, so simple stuff like, like on and off ramps. Often they're very expensive um, or they're limited in the sort of volume that you can do. Um, and then, you know, the final one, which I'll, I'll sort of highlight here is more of a I mean, more of a moral barrier than a legal one. So when we talk about this real, for example, you know, when you, the way you should be thinking about it is I've got crypto wallets all across the world. I now want to be transferring that value to some sort of real world asset class and then for repayment, bringing it back in. So you're exposing people towards financial products um, through the wallet interface. And this is what DAP stores are doing. You know, they're offering people the chance to purchase into some form of financial asset. So with that comes a responsibility. And that responsibility is you have to make sure that that person truly understands the product which they're getting themselves involved with. And this is a case where regulators in traditional finance have created reams and reams and reams of consumer protection legislation and investor protection legislation in order to regulate and tell you how to do that component. In a crypto world where you know we're dealing in a, a lighter touch regulated environment, we have to think quite sensibly about how we're going to do this with ethics and judgment, enabling the world to have faster, freer, cheaper capital flows, but still doing it in, um, in a sensible fashion. So that's one of the sort of bigger thinking challenges which uh, and policy challenges really, which we're gonna to have to be engaging with. One buzzword that I hear quite a bit within crypto is the word interoperability. Uh, and that's usually within the context of interoperability between blockchains, blockchain uh, dApps. But with, with real files, it's quite interesting because there is this interaction between the crypto world and, and the, the real world, whatever you, the real world, whatever you want to call it. Um, so you almost need st strategies for interoperability between these two domains that are kind of fundamentally very, very different. One unique approach to Cardano, at least from how I see it, is you know they, they take a very first principles approach, speak to governments, which is not not the sexy stuff in crypto, but very important stuff. These these partnerships with countries with governments is that like a fundamental. Uh, piece of the puzzle to create that interoperability between the crypto world and the, the real world. Absolutely. So the end state or the end game for me is a world in which we can stay completely within some form of crypto token all the way through the funnel. Because the beauty of this is then smart contracts have real power. Um, smart contracts start to lose value the moment you're introducing centralized intermediaries or breaking flow. So the hard yards is saying, okay, well, let's do central bank digital, digital currencies. Let's do a digital shilling so that we can govern these contracts all the way through execution and the smart contract has more value. Um, but to do this kind of thing, well, you probably have to talk to governments and they go wrong that we can go into the algorithmic stable coin versus reserve back sort of debate but one way or another if you're trying to skip out on regulation and not bring in the central bank they can make it very difficult for people to operate in these environments so i think it does have to be collaborative and i don't think it has to be scary for governments you know singapore has been issuing that central bank digital currency challenge where the goal is to have offline transactions that are better faster cheaper um, and, you know, we were actually a finalist in that challenge. And it was an amazing experience working cooperatively with, um, you know, with a central bank to do this. So, you know, they're not the enemy. Um, we can work cooperatively to, to build out a lot of this value. And if we do that, we get a lot more utility out of the things that we're building. They become exponentially more powerful. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that conversation doesn't have to be scary. Um, have you noticed the shift in sentiment, say, from the earlier, say a couple of years ago versus now, is it becoming more kind of um, 
a normal, less scary thing to talk about with with governments? I mean, it's it's night and day. I I used to have to batter down people's doors in government <laughs> to sort of get a meeting and to start talking about this kind of stuff. And now, very much, it's you know you, you get invited to be a part of this dialogue, and um, people want to meet you. They want to see about the the innovation and the value which crypto and blockchain can bring. So it's it's just completely different. I I can't even compare it. Hmm. So night and day in a relatively short period of time. So that's pretty pretty exciting to hear. Well, well, Blaine, I mean, you, you say it short. It feels like dog years to me. Crypto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, from your, start, from your perspective, get, an eternity. Yeah, I'm getting gray hairs now, you know, that, that's the first for me, and I'm blaming it, I'm blaming it all on crypto. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, I'd, I'd love to maybe talk a bit about scaling impact. So, so scaling impact is a, an idea that I'm quite passionate about. So I guess having... Um, moments of impact is one thing and having kind of isolated moments of impact is, is great and important but scaling those moments of impact to kind of millions and billions of people which is the scale that we're talking about in terms of trying to get identity solutions um, access to financial services uh, connectivity shout out to world mobile um, uh, um, you know affordable housing affordable sustainable housing shameless self plug from power so there is this the challenge of scaling kind of an isolated moment of impact to billions of people is is a challenge like in and of itself. So how do you approach that, that scaling challenge? Um, I guess specifically, how do you approach scaling real fire in Africa? So the, the scaling part in particular. For me, it's all about getting one or two sort of, key pilots done or or like winning the argument in a single country mm -hmm. and then from there you, you find that the distribution happens quite organically actually people will replicate success so off the work we're doing with digital identity with the ministry of education in Ethiopia, um you know now we're talking to five, five countries about the same sort of project um if we can get one national identity program done which is you know what i'm aiming for Quite quickly, I have no doubt that we'll see that replicated. If I can do, you know, and this is like a personal goal, but I want to be issuing $100 million of, of loans actually into Africa, all done from Cardano across the next year. If I could hit that, then very quickly you'll have, um, you know, you'll have other protocols joining in, the scale gets bigger, and you know, everything grows from itself. So you don't need to do it all yourself, you just need to sort of prove it's possible. And then things take on a life of its own. Interesting. Interesting that you said that pilot. So you almost need this proof of concept um, to help better have these conversations with, you know, investors or governments or some, something like that. You you need evidence that this new concept works and is, is is viable. And when we're dealing with, you know, models that haven't existed before, I, I think that's just naturally a part of the, the first step. Of, um, of scaling is just proving that this is an idea that can actually work in practice. Um, I'd love to talk about, so the Cardano blockchain. So uh, you've obviously obviously been in the Cardano space for a while. Um, I'm, I've been a big Cardano fanboy since kind of 2017, ever, ever since I saw the, the whiteboard video, like a lot of people. Um, in your opinion, what do you see as being some of the, the benefits uh, associated with the Cardano blockchain, either from a technical perspective or even like a philosophical or strategic perspective um, that makes it a suitable foundation on which entrepreneurs, developers, innovators can build these real fire applications on? Like what are those uh, points of difference Cardano has which make it kind of a, a viable um, platform to build on? Yeah, so I mean, I personally love our staking model. Um, I think it's really powerful. Um, I think that, you know, the whole transaction fee model, which we've adopted is a good starting point. Um, you know, I think I saw that there are more transactions now on Cardano um, than there are mm -hmm. on Ethereum or, or I sort of skimmed it. So apologies if I butchered some of the, the importance of that. Stack. And a hundred, but, hundredth know, of the fees. <laughs> well, exactly. Right. So, you know, I, I'm always quite blunt about this stuff. The reason why the volume's there is because of the fees. 
because it's a hell of a lot cheaper. Um, so I think we've always had the model that we want to sort of make these transactions very affordable. And then, of course, with the second layer scaling stuff coming out, that we'll be able to really deliver on that. You know, absolutely, um, we're trying to work to make sure that DeFi uh, can really have a big place on Cardano. And I think that a June hard fork is going to do going to do a lot for that. But you know, it's these like basic principle decisions over what we think fees should look like. I think that, frankly, having like identity baked in to both our wallet. So when our light wallet comes out, you know, identity will be a native feature. And thinking about what that, you know, what applications really require that is going to be a massive competitive advantage for us going forward. And then, you know, if I was to pick my most important differentiator, it's got to be the philosophy. I mean, look, I don't think that there are many other protocols which have, um, you know, senior team members and uh, serious efforts on, on Africa. Um, and that makes a huge difference because, you know, this isn't like a, this isn't like a charity or, or a virtue signaling exercise here. These lending and credit opportunities are going to make amazing yield opportunities for you. If you're American, if you're Brit, you're German, it doesn't matter. Right. So, you know, we believe that, that we should be creating utility in Cardano by working on this kind of real life stuff. Well, it's also driving down the interest rate for these businesses and people who will be borrowing. So this is really like a win win sort of uh, approach. And I don't think that many other protocols are, are that focused on this side. Um, and I'll stop ranting about how much I love real in a second. But as a final thought, you know, just think about the scale of the opportunity. How big do you think DeFi is? It's an absolute fraction of the size of these traditional lending and credit markets. So by bringing the technology and the innovations of blockchain and crypto to this behemoth of uh, traditional markets, um, you just you can create magic. So that that's why that's why I'm still working at Cardano, even though I'm grayer, older, and significantly <laughs> more tired. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of things that you said that that I resonate with as well. So a big one for me is the philosophy, the, the fact that Cardano is kind of a mission-focused blockchain. And um, that I'm, I'm always interested in, in these sorts of outcomes. Um, but I've worked in or been involved in a number of projects that are maybe not for profit um, within the environmental conservation space. And uh, a common challenge that I see quite a bit is there, because it's a not for profit, there's always a bottleneck around impact, which is to do with cash flow. Um, so you you always need what, at least in my opinion, in order to scale up that impact, you need some financial model uh, embedded or in combination with a mission driven uh, approach. Like combining those two, which is possible, and we're seeing more and more companies obviously adopting this kind of triple bottom line approach, but. With um with Cardano, you have this mission driven, this philosophy, and that attracts a certain kind of person. I say I've, I've been involved in a number of different kind of blockchain communities, just sussing it out. Uh, and the Cardano community is, you know, it is very it is very different. Like um, it's less about when Lambo or when Moon. It's more about like when change the world, uh, and like a very real, cool, non cliche kind of way. Uh, like it is. There's so many people out there that are. That have that as a driven uh, as a as a driving force for them, which I think is really cool. Um, mm. And also the the creating solutions that are win win. So having I think blockchain introduces these incentive mechanisms, which allow these kind of interesting um, incentive models where multiple people can can benefit from participating. And I, I think that's quite a that's more blockchain as as a whole, but. Um, we're seeing some interesting use cases for within the Cardano ecosystem at the moment. Um, so I get, got a, I went on a bit of a tangent there, um, but <laughs> <laughs> it's it's contagious. <laughs> it's contagious. <laughs> um, you, you were talking about Tyler Prism, so this is maybe a good segue for a, a community uh, submitted question uh, from Richard. So goes question for John: Can you inform us about the status of the Tyler Prism? Uh, when can a Tyler Prism be used for the first application? Uh, and do you see a use case for Tyler Prism in the Empower project? And I'll probably kind of like extend um, you know, use, use cases in RealFi in general. Mm. Um, so uh, I love, love putting pressure on our engineering team by, uh, <laughs> by confirming <laughs> timelines. So 
I mean, you know, I'm big to the promise that production, the very first production version is out next month, I think. Um, and that's important because we're, we're using it, you know, uh, for the Ministry of Education project. So I think uh, we register now like 1.2 million um, student, uh, student credentials, uh, data sets. And um, we, we sort of need to now instantiate that onto a Tyler Prism and start issuing all of the logins and all of that. So that process is, you know, happening now or imminently. Um, so, yeah, that's going to be the first production use case of um, Prism. And we've got a lot of other sort of enterprise or government, uh, government opportunities, which are all going to be using it this year. So... For the community to start using it, I think that the Plutus, um, the Prism Pioneers program uh, has been sort of in full swing. So yeah, I mean, I imagine that projects are going to be using the Prism identity system uh, this year. And actually, World Mobile is using it as well, actually, for subscribers. So, you know, very much this year, no pushing. Um, you know, we're going live sort of at the moment anyway with the MLE deal. Yeah. Thanks for the, the community question, Richard. Um, okay, so we've talked about uh, Empower, we've talked about kind of mentioning World Mobile. There's a few um, real fire applications already out there in the Cardano uh, ecosystem. What are some applications, real fire applications that you're kind of working on or, or excited about or see some excited, exciting uh, use cases for in the future? Um, so yeah, I think I mentioned the wire, which is this um, uh, like uh, yeah. autonomous collective uh, textile production um, model. is really cool. I mean, it's pretty futuristic and out there and beautifully utopian. And I think it just might work. So uh, you know, that kind of thing is great because you see people pushing the envelope on on what we might do with these sort of technologies. Um, you know, for me, the community is going to come up with all of this amazing. Uh, amazing projects and amazing ideas. I want to focus now on getting that basic financial provision, lending credit stuff done, which is why I talk about microfinance a lot. So that figure, which I gave you of uh, $100 million worth of loans done, you know, I don't know yet whether we'll be able to hit that, but I know the route forward to make that happen. I know what we need to be building on our side. I know the number of microfinance companies I have to inter integrate with. So that is my real focus for the year. I want to make it so it's completely seamless and that my dad can open up his, <laughs> uh, his Ada wallet and he can get exposure towards uh, Kenyan SME debt. Mm. Okay. okay. Uh, that's often a... Uh... Um, like a goal, like a test to see if we're at that level is if you can kind of tell your your mum or your dad to uh, you know, open up their card on their wallet and, and use it. Well, I mean, the issue is that both my parents have become complete crypto nuts. You know, when um, I when I started in when I started in this, you know, my mum was like, uh, what are you doing getting involved in all of this like magic money? scam kind of stuff and, and now you know all they do is send me videos of charles's charles's amas asking me whether <laughs> i've watched them so yeah i mean my utility to my family has just become as a, a, a crypto tip person that's all they care about is uh <laughs> asking about crypto so, yeah uh, fair, fair what you wish for <laughs> so okay maybe maybe on that so their opinion on crypto has changed since their first exposure to now what about your experience? So what are some things that um, you've perhaps learned through your experience so far and, and how have maybe some of your worldviews changed uh, through your this, this Cardano journey that you've been on so far? You know, the most amazing thing about Cardano has been showing me that you can build a worldwide community that supports and helps each other. And that all of the, the tricky parts about communities in terms of um governance you know which parts do we support how much do they get funded who has the right voice here you know who's got the expertise all of these things for me sort of coalesce around the catalyst experiment um mm. and a catalyst fund is for me the thing i'm just super proud of and super interested in and we're going to take the lessons from this as we start shifting over control of the cardano network from input output towards all of all of you guys 
and the mechanisms around which that control shift happens. Um, who gets to vote? Uh, do they get to vote on all issues? Or should some experts on, for instance, network protocol design have more weighting on this? So all of this kind of stuff, honestly, when we started, I, um, I thought that you know, everyone was being a bit naive that we could even take a bite into these issues. You know, my background, I studied um, politics, philosophy, and economics, and most of the politics side is basically a lesson in how hard it is to build governance and uh, mm -hmm. how, um, you know, how difficult it is to even begin these issues. I mean, uh, you know, Winston Churchill's quote on this is fantastic. Uh, Democracy is the worst form of government except for every other one that we've tried. <laughs> so, you know, even, even things like democracy, which we tout and we love, uh, you know, you've got some fantastic figures who are, you know, pointing out the flaws and the challenges in it. Uh, so, you know, the ambition to go and try to say, okay, we're going to build a worldwide governance system for the transfer and the management of value and financial contracts. And it's going to have like this like, capital pool element. And, you know, you can build uh, sustainable housing in Mozambique with it. And it's all owned by the community. And mm. that it's going to be an incentive mechanism which leads to long-term success uh it's it's crazy it's beautiful and it's brilliant and uh i'm you know i, I feel it's a privilege to work on it so mm -hmm. i'm excited to see where it goes you know i feel like charles always said this best he was like you know this is like a ginormous experiment um and yeah we have to keep experimenting um you know sometimes we make mistakes sometimes new technologies come we've got to implement you know use that horrible tech word of pivot um, but all the way through, we've gone, we've gone with intention and with mission and with vision. And as a result, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about where we're going to end up. Okay, so maybe on that, that note of where we're going to end up, I'm going to just, you, you mentioned the quote, I'm going to bring up the quote as well. I heard you say this in a previous video, and it's, I like this quote as well. I'm just going to quickly read it. One second, where is it? Uh, I'm, I'm very curious. I'm, I, I hope I didn't make it up. <laughs> uh, I don't know where it is. Oh, here it is. Uh, it's from Arthur C. Clarke. So, any uh, sufficiently yeah. advanced te technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, and I think right. uh, when you're talking about this, it was kind of related to, I guess, the, the potential of blockchain. Um, so, I'm, I'm curious with that quote in mind, what, when we kind of look at the future of blockchain and I guess some of the exciting things that we hope to see within the world of, of real fire and your vision for the five, 10 years from now, what are some of these magical moments um, that you hope to see within the, the real fire Cardano space? So if I can talk tactically, there's a whole bunch of stuff which we can improve. Um, one of the, the weaknesses of crypto is generally that the user experiences aren't very good. Um, we build things that work, but do they look beautiful? Are they intuitive to use? And still, I would say the answer is mostly no. Um, you know, we have these long um, alphanumeric integer strings, and that's your wallet address. So basic stuff like human readable addresses. Um, or the ways in which you might do account recovery. I mean, no one likes the mnemonics, like writing out these like 30 word seed phrases, like no one really likes that. Um, but, you know, it does solve the problem of how I can do account recovery. So I think that I don't have easy answers to these problems because there's always trade-offs between usability and security, but we have to do a bit better if we want to see this become the Arthur C. Clarke indistinguishable from magic solution. So we're not there yet, and that's okay. Um, we, we've, done, we've done pretty well so far, but that's where I want to see the innovation and better, simpler user experiences. Because once you hit that, that's when you get your J-curve growth. And that's when people will be using crypto products, they won't even know it. And uh, yeah, that's what I'm holding up for. Do you have a guesstimate to how long, how far away are we? are we from kind of these sorts of moments? Five years, 10 years, 20 years? Uh, I mean, I think very much of the five year time horizon. I think stuff is moving very, very quickly. Um, when you're in it, it can sometimes feel very slow and very frustrating, but actually, as you said, Blaine, take a step back and look how far we've come in five years. 
So um, I think that in five years we'll be, we'll, you know, real fi will be a real thing rather than, you know, uh, a word I coined um, that, you know, the Cardano community's picked up. I hope that, you know, it's, it's a much more significant endeavor. So yeah, I think that a lot of this stuff will change quickly. Okay. Um, last, last quick question, and that's kind of more of a call to action to people in this community who are interested to learn more. Um, what advice what advice would you give to the community who are interested in kind of real fi um the concept of real fi and want to get involved or learn more about it like where would you what advice would you have for them where would you point them what direction would you point them into i hate it when i'm asked questions like this because i'm always like if you just wait a bit then uh things will be clearer um but this time i really really mean it you know i'm i'm trying to work on some quite significant endeavors to sort of really define support and drive the real fi space. Um, and I think that if you give me two months, uh, I'll update the Cardano Africa website with a whole bunch of information and also meaningful programs that are going to make it quite easy to, to build on this space. Um, so that's the, the sort of tactical answer. Um, and then if you were to think of them strategically from, from each person's perspective, well, you don't really necessarily need me. Um, you know, whilst I've been very, very close with a number of the real five projects, um, you know, they've all taken their own destinies into their own hands. Um, you know, well Mobile has done fantastically. Uh, uh, no doubt that Empower will, will go from success to success. Uh, so yeah, you know, the other people who are doing this should also be your, your close allies and compatriots. So, you know, reach out to you, Blaine, you know, people can go and hassle you rather, rather than to, um, speak to the projects that have come before. All right. Great answer. Um, watch the space. Uh, it'll be cool. Yeah, maybe in a few months time, we can have a, uh, another, another chat if you have a moment, but um, I think that probably concludes the, the podcast today. So thank you everyone for, for listening. Um, we'll share this out. We'll cut this podcast into smaller clips to kind of get the word out there a bit more. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone for listening in and we'll see you in the next one. Bye everyone.